Welcome everybody to our webinar on supporting ethnic diversity in the environment sector. My name is Joseph, I'm policy lead at the IES and I'll be hosting the event today. The environment sector is one of the least ethnically diverse sectors in the UK. In order to understand and address this issue, it's crucial that we take a systemic approach to improving diversity. In 2022, we published our report, A Very Challenging Environment, Experiences of Ethnic Minority Environmental Professionals. Our report highlighted the need for action at multiple levels across the sector in order to understand the lack of diversity and inspire and enable uh, greater diversity. And a uh, link to that report will be posted as we uh, carry on. Uh, the, event, uh, the event will explore how action in different parts of the sector can support improved equity, diversity and inclusion for those from ethnically diverse backgrounds with a focus on research, routes into the sector and the professions. Today's event is part of the IES's Future of ES23 Horizon Scanning and Foresight project, where we're bringing together voices from across the environmental sciences through themed events, discussions and publications with the goal of creating a vision statement that sets out the different potential futures for the environmental sciences, as well as how we can create the kind of future that we want to see. This event is part of our fourth theme for that project, the workforce. And if you want more information about the project, uh, it's available on the IES website and links to the project will be posted into the chat box momentarily. Uh, today's event will be recorded and will be made available on the IES YouTube channel. In a moment, we're going to be hearing from all three of our speakers, each of whom I'll introduce when we bring them up to speak. Uh, and then afterwards, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions. You can submit those at any point during the event using the Zoom Q&A function, which should be on your screens right now. And if your question is for a particular person, please do just specify that in the question so that we can direct it to the right person. I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker, Ethne Childs. Ethne is Communities and Partnership Lead at the IES. Ethne is responsible for supporting the IES communities and building relationships with partners and stakeholders in the sector. Ethne is also a trustee for Charity Works, a charity which runs graduate schemes for the nonprofit sector and sits on a number of other steering groups, including the Equator programme, which she's going to be talking to us about today. So uh, thank you so much for joining us. And Ethne, uh, over to you. Thank you very much for that introduction, Joseph. Uh, it's great to be here today to talk about how increased ethnic diversity can be supported in environmental research. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the Equator project today, uh, which was a NERC funded project exploring how to remove barriers, improve access and enhance experience for ethnic minority students in geography, earth and environmental science research or GEES research. Uh, one thing to note straight off the bat, um, obviously I am not Natasha Dowie, as you can see on this slide here. Uh, Natasha was the principal investigator for this project, um, but was unable to join us for the event today. Um, but she was still really keen for the project to be talked about. Um, so I'm going to be delivering this on her behalf. Um, as Joseph mentioned, I did sit on the steering group for this project. Uh, but a massive thank you for to Natasha for providing me with this information and allowing me to deliver this presentation for her. Um, I should also mention that many people across many institutions were involved in this work, and I want to acknowledge their fantastic contributions here. Um, you can see a list of the project team and collaborating institutions, as well as steering committee members and partner organisations. Um, it is really important to note that our collaborators, researchers and steering committee all included people from diverse identities, backgrounds, career stages and disciplines. This project involved a lot of listening, co-creation and co-production between the team and the steering committee. And that's important to talk about um, before we get started on, on more of the meat of the presentation. So before I talk about the project, a really quick slide to just illustrate the issue, which I'm so sure we're all aware of. Um, but in the UK and other countries like the USA, it is well documented that geosciences are amongst the least ethnically diverse physical science subjects at undergraduate level, and that we have poor retention of students from ethnic minority backgrounds into postgraduate research. This is due to many reasons, including structural, organisational and cultural inequity, as well as discipline specific hostile environments. You can see here the breakdown in diversity in the total student population uh, versus in the earth sciences. And you can see this is a really stark issue. Um, uh, so this is kind of where we started from and, and the reason for some of these uh, projects that I'm going to be talking about. Um, it's worth noting that you'll see throughout this presentation that there are some QR codes at the, at the top of the presentation. Um, these will allow you to explore relevant evidence and papers throughout uh, regarding some of the information discussed. So just to flag that up there. So I'm now going to be talking about the project, what was done and some of the key findings from that project. 
Of course, uh, it should, I should say right at the beginning, that it is impossible to tackle all of the underlying issues in a short six month project. But the Equator project team set out to take some action. And the three main strands of the project um, are listed here on this slide. Um, and they were to increase retention and improve student experience through a ring fence mentoring network, which paired students with mentors from both industry and academia. The second was to improve access and participation through a ring fenced research school for ethnic minority undergraduate, masters and doctoral students. And finally, to set out to remove barriers to access by conducting advocacy for equity in postdoctoral recruitment with a doctoral training working group, which aimed to share best practice and develop recommendations to make PhD recruitment more equitable. Equator was novel because it was student led, collaborative, and used action research in a theory of change approach. Each intervention was also led by a researcher with lived experiences, uh, and these were Dr. Manira Raji at Plymouth University, Dr. Ben Fernando at the University of Oxford, and Dr. Anya Lawrence at the University of Birmingham. In this talk, I will briefly summarise each of the three interventions that I mentioned there, um, and highlight some of the key findings from each. Uh, sorry, my slides just gone a bit weird. Bear with me. There we go. Um, so the mentoring network set out to facilitate networking, improve a sense of belonging and build a body of experienced mentors. Ten mentees were each paired with one industry and one academic mentor. Uh, I should mention as well that all involved were paid for their time on this network. The network evaluation was really positive, with all participants feeling more confident at the thought of forging a career in the sector and have a greater sense of belonging within the, within the field of their network. They also felt more connected to networks that can help them in their career path and felt able to discuss concerns about these studies. Um, you can see here from um, uh, the findings from the survey um, after the mentoring network, which looked at how much they agreed with these statements and some really amazing um, evaluation results there showing how, how valuable this type of mentoring network can be. Uh, we also gave space for free text feedback, which gave further support to the scheme evidence and some selected quotes that you can read here. I always think that's nice to kind of give a bit of a, a personal touch to these types of presentations. Um, in general, feedback demonstrated that the interaction between mentees at an early stage in their academic careers and mentors with established careers in GIES research led to an increased sense of belonging and inclusion, increased likelihood of retention into research and the development of a body of experienced mentors to support future students. Equator mentees cited feelings of empowerment and improved confidence in continuing into postgraduate research following the project, and the majority felt more likely to pursue a career in GEESE research because of participation in the mentoring. On the other side, all Equator mentors uh, reported improvements in their personal skills development as a mentor and felt that being part of a, the Equator mentor network had increased their likelihood of being involved in future ring fence mentoring schemes. The research school aimed to build community and improve awareness, perceptions and preparedness for research careers that those from marginalised backgrounds often do not have equal access to or opportunity to take part in. So this was the second um, part of the project um, and for the research school there, there were 30 students who joined, um, who joined the school in Sheffield Hallam University for a five day residential research school. Um, the programme was streamed for 20 undergraduate and master students and 10 PhD students. Um, with different um, sessions in the school which were relevant to each. Students were paid £250 to attend to compensate for any work lost, as well as given accommodation and expenses. They attended sessions explaining um, all sorts of different things, but including what a, PhD what a PhD actually was, interview preparation, grant writing preparation, um, science communication sessions, a conference day and a whole lot more. A lot of thought went into planning speakers, safe spaces and inclusion to make sure that the event and the research school really went well. One thing that was really nice uh, is that it went work so well that participants did self form a group and started heading off to explore the Peak District in the evenings after the school had ended. Uh, so an excellent way to help create and, um, and a stronger sense of network for those that were taking part. You can see some pictures here of, um, of some of the people involved just to give you a bit of a flavour. The feedback again was really striking for the research school. Um, as you can see in these pie charts here, before the school, many participants weren't sure if they wanted to do a PhD. 
Um, you can see that only 22% were planning to apply to postgraduate research, whereas after the school, there was a massive change in that feeling, with 56% saying that they were planning to. Um, I really would recommend that you read Manira's article in Geoscientist magazine about the school to learn a bit more about it. Um, and again, it's linked on that QR code on the slide there. Finally, I'm going to talk about the third strand of the project, uh, which is the working group, which set out to gather information about current recruitment and retention practices and to consider and co-create best practice recommendations to report back to NERC for use in future doctoral training guidance. These involve three workshops with multiple NERC doctoral training partnerships in the UK, which you can see listed on the slide here, as well as PhD recruiters at a non-NERC funded institution just for comparison's sake. Survey data was also collected uh, to supplement some of those uh, working group findings. From this, the project team developed a set of recommendations that have been written up for a publication. Um, you can see again, a link here on the QR code. Um, these recommendations were quite wide ranging. Um, they include things like student facing recommendations, things like advertising on demographic specific networks, standard forms to express interests um, and mentoring for applicants. There were also procedural interventions, uh, such as the standardized collection of demographic characteristics, ring-fenced interviews and studentships, uh, and also evaluation interventions. Uh, so thinking on focusing on potential and not excellence, reducing the emphasis on supervisor SIFT, uh, and having standardized scoring and CVs. The hope is that when these actions are taken alongside other EDNI efforts, that they will lead to higher awareness, more diverse applicants, more equitable evaluation and improved diversity in research, leading to an improved sense of belonging and inclusion. You can see here the outcomes at the bottom in terms of how they fitted into that theory of change and the kind of feedback loop between them. So what are some of the key points from the project? I've done a bit of a whirlwind tour of it. As I said, I really would recommend that you go and have a look at the website and find out more. Um, but some of the headline findings were that the team learned that ring-fenced, fully funded interventions work. The evaluation really supported this. They learned that co-creation and sharing ideas and best practice is essential, but they also constantly recognized that these efforts are just a tiny part of the puzzle. Holistic, larger scale, state, larger scale efforts teamed with anti-racism training and other structural interventions at various stages of the educational pipeline are absolutely essential uh, to make the change that we need. Uh, and, and they need support from funding councils and other institutions. This is really just a small part of the action that should be taken. As mentioned, the Equator team have created a series of resources and how-to guides um, and a full report that has been sent to all UK geoscience departments. These are all openly accessible from the website. Um, and again, please do access these the QR code. Uh, you can see some examples here. Ensuring long-lived impact from the project was a key focus for the Equator team, uh, and so a key activity for them has been disseminating the findings, uh, and you can see some of the stages of that on this screen here. Um, they have disseminated Equator 1 um, and all of the uh, related resources and the full publication report open access. Uh, and what's really excellent news uh, is that the Equator 2 programme has started at the University of Birmingham, uh, was awarded funding, it began in March this year, uh, and the research school was actually held quite recently. Um, I know that the research team are really keen to support others in setting up similar initiatives, uh, so I would recommend that you get in touch with them uh, if that is of interest. This just gave a flavour of the work being done. Um, there's loads of resources to kind of support any similar initiatives that, uh, that people want to set up to think about how they can increase increase ethnic diversity in GIES research. Um, before I finish up, I just want to say a massive thank you to all of the wonderful participants who took part in these interventions. It couldn't have been done without them and for their trust in the team and in this work. And of course, a massive thank you to Natasha and the Equator team for this amazing project. Um, I hope this gave you a bit of a flavour of some of the work that can be done to improve ethnic diversity and environmental science uh, research. Um, and happy to take some questions at the end. Thanks, Joseph. I'll hand back to you. Amazing. Uh, thank you, Ethne. Thank you so much for the presentation and especially, like you say, for filling in for Natasha at the last minute. Uh, like you say, I think it was a really good whistle stop tour through the project and there were lots of insights in there, which I think really vindicate the value of and the importance of these kinds of initiatives. And I was particularly taken by that story in there of the self-formed group at the Peak District following the research school, which I really, I guess, really does show us how important these facilitating initiatives are for opening the door. But 
But equally, those recommendations really make the point about how much more there is to do in the sector. Uh, so please uh, remember to pop your questions in the Q&A box uh, for Ethne, but indeed also for the other panellists. And we'll be moving on at this point to our second speaker, uh, which is going to be Judy Ling Wong. Uh, Judy is a painter, a poet, an environmentalist and an expert advisor on multicultural environmental participation. She was awarded an OBE for pioneering multicultural environmental participation in 2000 and a CBE for services to heritage in 2007. She's a major voice on policy and practice towards social inclusion, and she holds a number of positions in the sector, including honorary president of the Black Environment Network and chair of the Green Apprenticeships Advisory Group. So just a taste of her uh, many forms of experience that she has. She's going to be talking to us in a moment about roots in the sector and how they can support improved ethnic diversity. So Judy, thank you so much for joining us and over to you. Hello everyone. I'm so pleased to be with you all. Today I will talk about the context and actions for building multicultural environmental participation, which is the starting point for entry into the environmental sector and then highlight the very special opportunity of access to the massive wave of green jobs that's supposed to be hitting us. At times you will see slides with a lot of text. These are for you to refer to afterwards. Most points are very obvious, but they need to be on the list for you, and I will not have time to go through them all. You're very welcome to the PowerPoint afterwards. This talk draws from the work of pioneering multicultural environmental participation through the work of Black Environment Network. Who we are and what we can achieve depends on how we see ourselves against the enormous pressure of how others see us. This is true for everyone, but especially for minorities. The 21st century poses a specific fundamental challenge Protecting people and planet is about worldwide collaboration in the context of a 21st century multicultural world. We've come a long way in confronting racism and recognizing the legacy of colonialism that poisons international collaboration through the domination of resources in the less economically developed world. Beyond holding onto the riches accumulated in the global north, the global economic structure continues to disadvantage the global south. 21st century science has now established the fact that the whole of humanity is a single blood related family and our ultimate country of heritage is Africa. Many people will find this very challenging as a scientific fact. Our movement across the earth has created cultures that are an expression of the full range of the potential of the human personality, and they are all ours to claim. The people that we call ethnic minorities in the UK are in fact the continuation of the global ethnic majorities of the world. The white population makes up only 11% of the world population. Engaging with our ethnic minorities gives us the opportunity to gain the ease of intercultural exchange and negotiation that is so much needed in worldwide negotiations, contributing to the potential of the contribution, contributing to the protection of the immense and beautiful reality of people and planet. And here in the UK, mixed race Britons are the fastest growing minority group. It has been predicted that by the end of the century, one in three will be mixed race, and the figure is predicted to rise to 75% by 2150. Mixed race is literally the future. The goalposts therefore keep shifting, and it is good to see that the enforced reflected qualities that has been developed as a result of the isolation of COVID, the impact of the death of George Floyd, the proposal of the significance of infrastructure and the role of structures by Black Lives Matter, and the theme of resilience set within climate justice. They all come together to give impetus to the agenda of equality, diversity, and inclusion locally and globally. Be optimistic in our efforts to move towards a worldwide multicultural collaborative solution. 
there is no such thing as a purely environmental initiative. A so-called purely environmental initiative is one that has rejected its social, cultural, and economic dimensions. And it is great to see that that way of thinking is now entering policy. At the top, Wales leads the way. This integrated approach is expressed in the government's Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. Note the presence of those four key words that Ben proposed in 1987, social, cultural, environmental, and economic. There's a whole spectrum of work we can do to build the framework and enhance the process of full participation as a reality. Participation in sustainability as a whole depends on the relationship of people to nature and the relationship of people to each other. Emotion drives the quality and the degree of action. If all of us love nature deeply enough, we would never have damaged it in the way we have. And if we loved people deeply enough, we would not damage them. If we look into the deep heart of climate change, it is a spiritual and moral failure. We must make policy and policymaking inclusive and visible. And there are resources and examples of good practice listing all the barriers to building participation with documents like these to refer to, kaleidoscope, or the mosaic model, which lists all the barriers to relationships. We're not a square one. It is good to see assertive minorities in the countryside breaking into farming and multicultural arts groups taking on the theme of climate change. Creativity and the arts can play a significant role. We now have a new generation of multicultural environmental activists and experts the list of over 150 is growing. This open database is used by conference organizers looking for speakers, media, consultations, roundtables, workshop leaders, outreach workers, and so on. See if you can add to the list. Multicultural inclusion continues to need to be built and sustained. After 30 years of work, working with participation, I can collapse the whole process into two simple phrases. We love what we enjoy and we protect what we love. The first part is about access. The recent highlighting of the, the lack of urban green spaces in deprived areas is part of this. If we are not fundamentally in contact with nature where we live and grow up, then the process that leads to contribution will not be kickstarted. Here comes more lists, the representation list. Inclusive, positive visibility is improving as we now see many organizations able to display images of minorities. We need more of it in media and in community within the communities like newsletters, and then crucially in structures of power. The engagement process list. All of us know about outreach now, but in-reach is the measure of success. When members of minorities through contact and participation make the links with the positive benefits to their own community, they begin to reach into them, doing your work for you. Training and support and information provision, and whether you call them champions or whatever title you and minorities find useful, this adds to the picture of working together. And ethnic minorities is like the living world news. What the media chooses to neglect can be accessed through engagement with minorities that have family and friends in all the countries of the world. Provision is an interesting aspect. It highlights the fact that there's a limit to what individuals and small groups of citizens can do. Here we move into the arena of provision by organizations, local authorities, and government. A beautiful example here, wildflower medals that no individual can accomplish on a grand scale on derelict land around housing estates, benefiting people and wildlife. Now, 
not least of all, even last, I wish to highlight the unique opportunity to build diversity in the sector through the coming massive wave of green jobs that we can look forward to. Investment in this massive wave of green jobs is one of the key actions by government to hit net zero and fulfill the UK's legal commitment. The Green Jobs Delivery Group and the Green Apprenticeships and Technical Education Advisory Panel form part of the government's ambitious plan to build back greener and achieve net zero by 2050. The emphasis is on skills provision and green careers pathways. There's an investment of 12 billion that has in access that 2 million green jobs are needed in the UK and 65 million worldwide. Frameworks for training and publicity for the range of green jobs is being put into place right now. And I hope you will all help with this, targeting groups such as minorities, young people, people in job provision, and so on. Change is the coming together of thinking, feeling, and action. If we think and have information and do not feel, we do not act. If we feel but do not have the information, our thinking may not lead us to the right actions or the right directions. We need to explore and refine our actions. And of course, finally, without action, nothing changes. Here we see Rodri Morgan who has passed away at an event focused on the creation of healthy and sustainable versions of traditional food recipes to tackle obesity among minorities. As First Minister of Wales, Rodri knew the importance of finding time to be among members of the community. He came and cooked with us. Giving prestige to engagement with minorities and with green issues relevant to their lives is really important. That is the stopping point, the base from which access to participation, to jobs, to power structures and so on really start. I look forward to more practical visionaries and equal warriors, including many from minorities. Let's work together for an inclusive, vital, green future. Thank you for listening. Amazing. Thank you, Judy, uh, so much for that presentation. I, it was great to get that really expert perspective on everything from demographics to climate justice to policy making and how it all ties together through those themes of equality, equity, diversity and inclusion. Uh, I couldn't possibly summarise it all because you've, you've already done so well with that amazing quote. We love what we enjoy and we protect what we love. What a fantastic lens into thinking about these issues. So, so thank you again, Judy, so much for that great presentation. Attendees, please do remember to pop your questions for Judy and the other panellists in the Q&A box. We'll come to those in a moment. We've already got quite a few have come through online already. But before we do, uh, finally, we're pleased to introduce Karen Devine. Karen's the Director for Communities and Inclusion at the British Ecological Society, BES, and Karen leads the society's equity and inclusion work, including how they support their members from marginalised communities and how they fund and publish ecological research. Karen's work includes support for UK-based and international ecologists where the barriers are varied and systemic. So naturally, uh, Karen's going to be talking about the work of the BES in this space. Uh, so Karen, over to you. The British Ecological Society is a very wordy name for an organisation, so for shorthand I tend to use BES and I'll be using that several times. It's quite difficult to follow Judy's talk really and I'll try and reflect on some of the comments that Ethne made which overlap with some of our own work. But what I wanted to do first was to give you a quick overview. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about who we are because we work in both a national and an international setting but actually our journey, which has really been an odd one, and I would describe it as we went from implementing EDI to actually having a strategy to actually then implementing again. And that's led to some really interesting reflections. And then finally, given that this talk is about supporting the professionals, what it is that we have as, as professional organisations, as learner societies, whether it's us or anyone else, that allows us to really support people across lots of different career routes. So in terms of who we are, um, most of our funding and our money comes directly from eight journals. 
Those journals are very international. They have very international editorial boards and they have very international authors and contributors. And that's quite key to one of the key EDI challenges that I'm tackling right now. Across our organisation, we have about 7,000 members. And one of the interesting things that we note is that around 66% of them are in the UK. About half of them are PhD students or master's level students, but only 49% actually identify as white. And that's quite an interesting number for us to think about when we think about our membership. Most of our members are academic researchers. Most of our members join us for lots of reasons, but our annual meeting is one significant one. But you can actually engage with society in different ways, and these are key. So this is about to change, which is why it says our communities as at 2023 is anyone can join our communities, of which we have 19 special interest groups. Now I'm currently working on this and I know that from all the other organizations that I've benchmarked, we're one of the very few organizations where you don't have to be a member. We've actively made a decision that we will continue that process to allow them to be free to join, specifically from an EDI point of view. We have another free to join EDI networks, and I'll talk specifically about the Read Network, which supports racial and ethnic um, equality and diversity a little bit later on. And then for completeness, but I'm not going to talk about today, we have four UK policy groups that really reflect the national environmental policy work that we do. In terms of a quick timeline, what I wanted to do was give you a very quick overview, won't go through everything. We've really been focusing on EDI work since about 2015. We made a number of decisions that, that are worth reflecting on because they affect our approach today. And the first is that it's always chaired by our president. It's all, it was initially um, attended by the CEO, but at that time in the past, we were very new to this kind of work. It was very operational. It was things like what data shall we collect? How will we collect it? Who will collect it? After about four years, we'd moved on a little bit. And actually, that's when I came into this role. Um, our CEO still attends. But at that point, during a strategic review and setting a new strategic plan, we, we implemented inclusive as one of our three core values. Now, that's stayed with us ever since. We've never let go of it. But what we did start to do as an organisation was when we defined our strategy, we then went out to every single committee responsible for developing our projects and our ideas and said, you have to tell us how it's inclusive. In order for it to stand, it has to be inclusive. And what we noticed was that there was slowly growing a culture of commitment. Every staff member in the organisation could talk about inclusion, could talk about how their work was contributing to inclusion. Then the world changed a bit. Um, the, in 2020, after the George Floyd murders, we, we set up and actually supported the setting up of the Reed Ecological Network. It was set up by two or three um, members of our community. Both of them, I know, have been on the Equator programme. Today, it's got nearly 100 people. Every single person in that network identifies as a person of colour or an individual for whom racial or ethnic discrimination has been a barrier in their education or their career development. It was initially set up to be primarily UK focused, but actually it's very international. And it's international for potentially quite sad reasons. One is that they feel they don't have the same resource in their own country. And the second is that well, we work in research, we work in ecology and the environment sector. It's a global discipline. And that means that those discrimina discriminations occur to and happen to an international audience. The big benefit of, of 2020 was that COVID meant that we had to really change how we did things. And that forced us into a new space. Some of those are positive things. And then I've got a, a quick mention of something that was very negative. <coughs> Last year, we actually revisited our strategic plan. 
inclusive remained. But actually we realized that we needed include more than inclusion in our values. We actually made sure that equity, diversity, inclusion were explicitly articulated in every single one of our five goals. And that it was a standing sub goal all by itself about how we are resilient as an organization. We don't need our equality diversity working group anymore to be operational. Instead, it's our advisory group, it's our members, it's people with lived experience who help us design the strategy. But we have equity champions alongside that, people inside the organizations whose job it is to implement, develop the programs, evaluate the success of those programs and make sure that we're delivering for our membership. The final thing actually is, is that that process led to a staff restructure so that for the first time ever, we have a director at Communities and Inclusion. I'm the director of it, but it now has job roles and job titles and a whole directorate with inclusion as their explicit remit and their description. So it's a quick overview of how we got to where we are. But one of the things I wanted to share about from an organizational point of view and how we support our membership and the profession is that prior to 2022, I'd been listening to lots of people tell us we were showing real leadership, that we had a strong culture, that we had all of these wonderful things. And I kept thinking that's not true because the thing that we don't have and we didn't have in 2022 where any of the systems, the right strategies or the centralized process, none of those things. And the more I spoke to people, the more I realized that it's this is, is this where success is, is having the right culture and the right systems in place. Does that lead to success? And I quite like that. <clears throat> but actually, I think it's more than that. What I really think it is, is, is culture but it's about that ongoing awareness, that evolution and willingness to evolve. And it's still about the systems. It's about having the right processes and the training in place. But it's more than that. Actually, what I've come to realize is that there's also a role for leadership. Our board of trustees are in control of the money that we spend, the resource that we allocate, and the priority that we put onto having a more diverse environmental sector. But it's also about the capacity of our team, not just our staff team, but our volunteers and our members to understand what we really mean by equity and inclusion, about the lived experience, about the barriers, about privilege, all those different issues that allow us to move forward with EDI work. And really thinking about not just building capacity, but how we share and strengthen capacity, both in a national context, but equally, as, as Judy's referenced, in the context of a global north, global south divide, how we share and strengthen the capacity to move forward. But it also has to be multi-scale. It also has to focus on individuals, also has to have that organizational change. And across the sector, none of us can do everything. Each of us has specific roles that we can fulfill, whether we work in an education with those, those students choosing their undergraduate degrees, those who are trying to get into employed positions or research positions. And then it comes back to that wider international and national strategies. The only way we're gonna achieve true global equity in the environment sector is if the wealthier nations rethink how we fund, how we research, how we publish science. And that's a massive change that we have to bring about. But I think in between all of that is where the success might be. It's gonna be a lot, lot harder to find. And I'm more than willing for anyone to disagree with me and reshape this. But I think for where I am right now, this is where we are as an organization. So as a professional body, responsible for supporting individuals, how do we do it? So our board of trustees, they're, they're our leaders, and actually they're working on a specific project around international equity and ecological research. What is it that we, as, as an organization, what is it that we as the UK, as the Global North, how do we as funders, as publishers, showcase leadership? How do we actually support more equity and inclusion. 
I'm going to come on to in a minute why we allocate future income because we've been doing a great piece of work in publications. It's causing us a problem up here. But one of the things that they could do and they did do as a board of trustees is to insist that every single committee within the organisation had true representation as far as practically possible. That did involve making our meetings online. It does involve getting comfortable listening to people in other languages, and it does involve in engaging with very different perspectives. Our journals have done a brilliant job of, of diversifying our editorial boards, but now we have a problem in that we've done a brilliant job of diversifying our editorial boards. There's really good representation on our editorial boards from people across the entire planet, except that our journals provide all our income as an organization, and most of that income gets spent in the UK. So going back to our board of trustees, how do we now start to allocate future income? How brave are we gonna be if we have to redesign our projects to be much, much less UK centric? The other things that we can do is to actually think about how do we make membership more affordable? And one of the projects that we're looking at is, do we stop charging a flat expensive fee and start thinking about percentages of local salaries and doing the work to find out what local salaries are? If an ecologist wants to attend a scientific conference, it can be as much as their entire annual salary for a year to be able to attend it, when for a UK person, it's 10% of their salary. And that's not particularly equitable. And membership is key to many things like event attendance and grant allocation. Linked to grants, one of the commitments we're about to make is that 51% of all our grants are allocated to Global South countries. Acknowledging that Global South is not a great name, but using language around something we all understand. In terms of our events, it's thinking about how do we look at registration and learning from the pandemic, how we have more hybrid events, which provide meaningful engagement. Hybrid events are easy to do. Meaningful hybrid events that allow people to grow and build their careers and skill share and build networks and build research collaborations are much, much harder to do. And then from an education point of view, it's how do we prioritize those marginalized and lower opportunity groups? Now we do that in different ways. So we have a, an undergraduate summer school, really quite similar to the Equator program that's been described. It prioritizes equity criteria. It takes 50 students for a whole week. It's a life-changing experience. But we also have a number of other projects. We have a Connecting Schools, which very much focused on disadvantaged students and was part of the Green Recovery Challenge Fund. Pre-pandemic, and anyone can come and talk to me about this because I would love to bring it back, we ran a dedicated summer school for minority ethnicity 17-year-olds. Because whilst we want more people to become and to pursue PhD opportunities, less than 5% of the undergraduate population on degrees that would allow that kind of progression, including geography and all the various environmental ones, represent any real diversity. And that's a real shame. You can't pull through from the undergraduate population if you haven't pulled through from the school population. Now, pre-pandemic, it worked really, really well. The thing that we discovered during the pandemic when everybody else moved online is that the core group of people we really wanted to reach those from minority ethnicities from low-income backgrounds were also digitally marginalized alongside being marginalized due to their ethnicity and that's a real barrier that we have to rethink and come back to and the other thing that we have is mentoring through read now read is racial and ethnic equality and diversity it was a network that we set up in 2020, and it's now got over 100 people supporting it. The whole point of that network is that it provides a safe space. It provides a space to talk about the challenges, but to provide mutual support. And what they tend to focus on is the kind of training, the grants writing, the networking, the being in the field, 
tackling racism in the field, all those kinds of opportunities where you need space to have those discussions. But the whole point of communities inclusion is to provide a safe space for any group and to make the BES accessible, but also to amplify the voices of those marginalised groups to facilitate their project ideas, to take forward their ideas. And a few of them have been to talk to me about how they replicate the equator within the BES and to give them leadership over their own opportunities. Just to go back to this speech bubble here, one of the things that happened when I did our 17 year old summer school was I discovered that there are very, very few UK born professors who are also people of color. But there are lots of international people and that can be both a strength and a disadvantage. And for me, tackling this group, this age group around the 17 year olds is a key group to focus on. So just as a final point to finish off with, I think from our end, equity is, is very individual, but it's also a very systemic issue. And regardless of the work we're doing, we're always hearing from people who feel that their needs are not being met by us or by others. And so it has to be an embedded in everything that we're doing, central to everything that we have to do. And I think that circle between strategy and implementation is a continuing journey. We implemented a great project with our journals, but actually it's led to a strategic discussion about what we do with the income that we now get from that great piece of work when that looks like we are, we are spending money in the UK based off the work of people outside the UK. I think the other thing that we need to think about in all of this is contributing to the discussions. Those who contribute to the discussions often take a career hit. And so we need to amplify those voices and the contributions must be valued. The Read Network would love to be here, but they can't afford to be here because they have to be doing paid work elsewhere. And the other thing that I would say is that every single piece of work that we've done that has showcased any form of diversity, not just ethnic diversity, has got complaints. So we need codes of conduct and we need duty of care processes. And I think the other thing that we have to do is to stand up for what we believe in. Thank you. So if you'd like to get in touch, my email is there. If you're really interested in the Read Network, um, Ferreza looks after the Read Network membership, but it is actually chaired by Jordan and Susmita and the Partnerships Officer is Justin. You don't have their last names because I hadn't got permission, but I thought it was really important you knew who they were. Thank you. Amazing. Well, thank you, Karen. Uh, thank you for that presentation. I think it was a, a really excellent insight into the BES's journey over the past eight years or so. And I think Judy asked us for practical visionaries, and I think you've definitely shown us how BES is rising up to try and take up that mantle. Loads of evidence in there of the practical steps to build communities that you've been taking. And I think I think it was particularly interesting to hear about that approach to embedding inclusion in every aspect of the organisation and its work. So, so thank you again, Karen. And indeed, thank you to all of our excellent speakers. We're going to move straight into the Q&A session so that you participants can start throwing questions back to them. As we go, please do put those questions into the Q&A box. We've got a couple in the Zoom room from participants, so we'll, we'll try and prioritise those, but we've also got a few from online, so we've got a nice mix of questions, but we will start right now with one of the questions that comes into us from the Q&A box. An anonymous attendee in the Zoom call is asking us, and I think, so this came in during Effie, your presentation, so I think we'll start with you, but I think equally, Karen, uh, it's a question you might want to answer. How did you ad advertise for participants to the research school, and was there any selection process for those who attended? So, uh, Ethne, should we start with you? Yeah, thank you, Joseph. Um, so participants were actually recruited um, through various different means. Um, so that varied from um, art, asking GIES uh, educators in UK universities to advertise them to their students, advertising on different social media, um, via the Equator Research Group website, um, and also through through some of the partner partner organisations like the Royal Geographical Society, for example. Um, and so that's kind of how we went about um, recruiting them. And then in terms of participant selection, um, there were a number of eligibility criteria um, that was kind of done used as a first sift. Um, so that was things like being um, 18 years or older, um, a British citizen, um, self-identifying as Black, Asian or minority ethnic, in geography, earth, environmental science. Um, although it is worth mentioning there, actually the active study at the time of the school was not a requirement. It's just that you had been in, in the Gies research environment. Um, and then after that, once uh, the kind of eligibility sift had been done, um, there was still um, too many for the number of places available for the research school. So actually it was just done via a random number 
generator so everyone had an equal uh, opportunity of joining the school. Amazing. And Karen, did you have a similar approach, different approach? Um, a little bit similar, but also it's a much longer story. So we, we first launched our summer schools in 2015. And I'd say at that time that they were they were very white. Um, they were very middle class. Um, they had been to Operation Wallace here and any number of different kind of um, summer school, uh, summer programs. What happened is we effectively had over 250 applicants year on year for 50 spaces. So over time, we listed it as EDI criteria were effectively the core recruitment strategy. And now it's become very well known for that. So we find very, very few people apply without EDI characteristics in their background. But what we did was work very hard with people to say that the reason for asking for that information was so that we could support them in accessing the summer school. So by working through those processes, we were getting more and more applications around, particularly around ethnicity, but also LGBT and disability where universities occupational health were not necessarily allowing them to do field work. So I would say it was a, it's a combination of reaching out, but it's I think now we're at a stage of reputation. Great, thank you. And Judy, I think you wanted to come in on this as well, didn't you? Yes, I just want to generally talk about the fact that for any kind of pursuit, where the study or jobs is, it has first of all be within your consciousness. Now, I've been talking to actually the Department of Education about how to build in very early consciousness of green jobs. And I thought to myself, some of the really complicated green jobs and apprenticeships coming up, people have never even heard of them. You know, can most teenagers even name a range of study courses and green jobs? They can't. So it has to be in the school system. So I thought to myself, what, at what age does one become sort of conscious thinking about I just sort of honed in on age eight and then I talked to my early year specialist friend and she's no no she says nursery what she says if you look at the educational system there are points right through from nursery to the end of second school where if you are determined you can build in a program that awakens aspiration to any kind of green study or course and have it in the atmosphere and work go she gave me the example in nursery as well the mandatory activities you have to dress up as careers she says why not a green career in nursery level you see, once you started saying this, I thought, wow, you know, you can really build up awareness. And then with all the complicated green jobs, you can't throw a complicated green jobs like, you know, data analysts for environmental sort of some sort of theme or whatever at an eight year old. But you can throw that at a 13 year old. So you need to go through the range of jobs and show how through the years to introduce appropriate careers that they can understand. So by the time they're 16, all this is in their minds and they're already choosing. Because one of the answers I, I was given by um, DFE said, they said, oh, but at 16, they can go to careers advice. I said, well, it's too late. When at 16, you never heard of these green jobs or study courses, and you're thrown all of them in front of you, you cannot take them in. That is not choice. To have choice, you need to build it into that consciousness right from the word go. And then that provides you with real entry points and career choices and study choices when you're ready to make those decisions. Thank you for that. That's a really good point about. And it's again, it's bringing us back to this theme of integrated approaches, isn't it? And uh, it's actually our next question comes in on that. Uh, and it's a question for you, Judy, but it's potential oh. one I think Karen might want to come in on. But it's not integrated approaches to education this time, it's integrated approaches to policy. So uh, you highlighted, Judy highlighted the uh, Future Generations Act in Wales with these kinds of integrated approaches to policy, but limited political attention. How do we scale up these kind of approaches, such as the one in Wales, to the UK level or even the international level? So, Judy, maybe for some initial thoughts, and then Karen, you also talked about that really important international scale. So you might have some opinions on scaling up as well. So, Judy? All these ideas of target groups, isn't it? When we say target group, you usually say the most deprived. We're almost trained to do that. What about target groups are the people at the top? You know, that they need to understand, that ministers need to understand, 
And a lot of groups realize, I mean, the foreign trade sector does a lot of educating ministers, and they're very annoyed that they have to do it over and over again every five years. He said, just when they begin to understand, they have gone, you know, with, with change of government and so on. So this sort of, of the people who have this view and, and the uh, whole understanding of integrated approach and scope have to educate people in power to get it into policy. Absolutely, great, uh, great point. Um, Karen, did you have any opinions on scaling up at all that you wanted to share? Um, on the international front, without being political, no. Um, I think it, as, as the UK, we have to be very, very careful. It's not our place to tell another country how to develop their own education programs and their own education policy. But actually, we work in, in a truly international sector. And there is something about recognizing that ecologists, environmental scientists are an international cohort of individuals, and they have to be able to collaborate with each other. So the barrier is how we facilitate and how we fund that collaboration effectively. Global solutions are entirely global. They're not national. Everything else, I think, delves into a political scenario, I'd be less hesitant to, to publicly share. But I do agree with, with, with Judy's point in that you do need an integrated approach across all education stages. You need consistency and you actually need it to be resourced. There's lots of evidence that lots and lots of schools are truly struggling to deliver really inspiring environmental work because it takes money and it takes time to do that kind of thing. Not sitting in a classroom, having knowledge crammed into your brain day in, day out. Amazing, thank you. And that collaboration point is a really important one. And it's also a theme in this next question that we have here, which is directed at Ethne. Um, lots of uh, good initiatives uh, that you're describing um, and increasingly seeing a lot more initiatives across uh, the environment sector. But how can we bring projects together so that they complement each other rather than compete with one another? And maybe there's a theme of that collaboration going through that as well, Ethne. Yeah, thank you, Joseph. Um, this is a really important question. Um, so um, uh, building on what Judy and Karen have already said, this is a systemic issue with action needed at multiple levels at multiple times within, uh, within the kind of the, the pipeline of environmental science. And that starts, as Judy said, right from school, all the way to um, nurturing leaders who are already in the sector and getting them into those leadership positions. Um, in terms of um, promoting collaboration uh, for, for systemic issues, no one has all of the answers. It, it is a puzzle. Um, and each person holds a little bit of that puzzle piece. Um, so the main thing is sharing knowledge, sharing learning, not being afraid of sharing things that don't work as well as things that do work. I think there needs to be a lot of um, transparency around the different types of projects that people are doing and where we are seeing change and where, and where change isn't happening. Um, breaking down those silos and having spaces for um, quite frank conversations, I think, um, is really important. So anything where we can convene people together and let them share best practice, um, is going to be absolutely essential. I think conversations like this are really important because um, as Judy said as well, consciousness is really important. And if people don't know about the different projects going on in the sector and aren't collaborating, um, then those impacts are going to be limited if, if they're impactful at all. So I think it's really about bringing people together, collaborating wherever possible, and then share, sharing those findings for different interventions. Um, and really recognizing, as we've said, that systemic issue and making sure that any interventions we do aren't just focused on one part of that pipeline. We need multiple actions happening at the same time at all different levels of that pipeline. Amazing, thank you. And uh, Judy, did you want to come in on this one? So I want to give a, a very interesting and amazing example of uh, a young doctor who is from a background that, that is minority, and it occurred to her that doctors, the, the application to become doctors come from very few schools. Many schools, the communities of the schools and so on, their children never think about being a doctor at all. And so she decided to do something about it and put it on the agenda. So, so she actually worked in partnership with a university and they're paying university medical students to go into five pilot schools to talk about the profession. 
And the other thing they're doing is very interesting in terms of building support. Oh, she's called Dr. Lian Armitage, and she and just a couple of friends set up the Lian Armitage Foundation. They have amazingly motivated youngsters. And they are going into schools and they have this vision. So they have what they call Armitage Juniors, where you are actually eight to 10 years old. And then you have Armitage Seniors, about 13 to 14 years old. And they're supported age wise and have contact with what people learn in the university, how the training is, and all sorts of people to talk to right through those years. And they're just coming in one lecture about the medical profession and disappear. So it's really interesting to see how they're going to, to actually un, unfold and what their success is. But you know, having the support of a local university to do this, some payment towards medical students, which also helps them with their jobs, and having this vision of support, I think it can be done in many areas of other careers. Amazing. Thank you for that, Judy. And uh, you mentioned success. So we'll use that as the embarrassing segue into the next couple of questions, because we have a couple of uh, questions here asking, so sort of picking up on what you said, Karen, that important question of what uh, success should look like. Um, so we've got a couple of questions for you, Karen, building on that. One's very long, one's very short. So we'll start with the, the short one, uh, maybe bring some other people in, and then we might get to the long one, which is uh, for small employers in particular, but other small organizations as well, you have limited resources, how can they take that approach to measuring success and what should they be trying to achieve, Karen? Sorry, I was amusing myself. Depends on what you mean by small. We're 35 people. And actually as a, as a director of communities and inclusion, well, we're only nine people. So it depends on that definition of small. And I think it's the decision that you make as an organization because actually that's what we've done. We, if I think about what we've invested in terms of a, a percentage of our staff resource as a percentage of our budgets, it's probably a good significant amount of money, but it comes from that. But anybody can do anything, but you do it at the scale that's right for your organization. The bit that is different is how much of your organization you're willing to, and you have capacity to contribute to it. So I think it's a really, really difficult question to, to define definitively. No, we, we only ask difficult questions here, <laughs> uh, Karen. So, uh, well, uh, uh, does anybody else have any perspectives they want to throw in on that before we move on to maybe the bigger question? And it's bigger in, in length of question, but not necessarily bigger than the question we've just asked. Uh, Ethne, I see you've unmuted. Um, I mean, I completely agree with Karen that it's a really difficult question to answer and it's going to be so dependent on, on each organization's um, kind of setup and, and, and uh, situation. But I think uh, just to throw in there that you can't measure success of something you're not measuring. So that measurement uh, piece is really important and making sure that you're consistently measuring um, uh, metrics that can show you how, you know, how diverse your em your employees are or, or your members or whoever that might be. Um, you need that measurement piece down so that you can at least um, have kind of a baseline understanding of some of the changes that are going on. Great, thank you. And Judy, did you also want to come on on that or not? You? It's a difficult one because in, in a way, when you target something like in, you say, ethnic minority communities, I mean, it is hell of a range of people and they are everywhere. They're not just local and so on. And I think the measure of success is really success of what you can do in combination with what everyone else is doing that you really have to have a web of initiatives coming from different areas like the media has to give make an, a commitment your local newspaper might make a commitment that's going to make a, a big difference through the years as an ongoing commitment for example that things appear in the local newspapers and build that atmosphere and sense of possibility and where the opportunities are for example and I've been talking a lot also about particular organizations producing copy that community use newsletters can just sling in, making it really easy for people to talk about. It. So, for example, you can work with minority communities locally, let's say, with one just one ethnic minority community locally. You can may, maybe have an agreement with that community group that every three months, in their newsletter, they would describe a career or a research post 
or whatever. So these images are drip fed into the community. So you don't flood people, but it's presence, the presence of opportunity. And, so, and the, for example, with some organizations, including the Institute for Green Apprenticeships and Technical Education, when they talk about the apprenticeship and, and the job, I said, would you please put in the pay? People are extremely interested in how much they're going to be paid. So the, the sort of stimulus comes in from different directions, the interest, an idea of the setting of the job. I mean, for example, some jobs are very industrial in their settings, so, and people have no idea how you enter industry, for example, even as an academic. So all these things have to become visible and familiar so that you can do this. So, so businesses and so on that want to do this, you think about what is the image of what they're trying to do to get people into? Can they get that image into people's minds so that it can be considered at all? So these are the challenges, I think. And, and we cannot do it alone. We need the local newspapers. We need the radio. We, we need community newsletters. We need things happening at schools and all sorts of things working together. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, feeding on that. I think that was, that was really great. Um, so, Karen, the second question on this topic uh, says, Karen, uh, I think it was really impressive to hear how BES identified that things weren't quite working how they should from a systemic perspective, even when you were getting good feedback. Are you able to share your approach to self-reflection on EDI uh, to help others to reflect better on their own approaches to finding out how making things work? Um, when when we were going through this process, we did not have a dedicated staff member. But I've always had a deep interest in equity and inclusion. And we, we had lots of different projects across the organisation. Lots of people were talking and saying things like we were showing leadership. But I, I knew we didn't have an EDI strategy. When people were asking me for the strategy, we didn't have one. And I was, I was kind of making it up as I went along. I also knew that internally that there were, there were issues around data collection. So I think some of it is around being honest with the fact that the systems are either just not there or the ones that are there are not working properly. And we did undertake a review. So one of the jobs I set out to do very quickly was to say, well, let's write an EDI strategy. And from that, we very quickly discovered that there were so many gaps in information. And that's the bit that made me start to really think if we have, if we have a, a strong culture, but we have no processes, what, what's the problem? And actually it was, I think the key thing for me was, was really talking to others in the sector. So I was working a lot with Wildlife and Countryside Link. I was talking to other professional bodies, all of whom had beautiful strategies. But I also knew that they had staff in those organisations that didn't find them particularly equitable or, or they had trustees who were not particularly inclusive. So I think it's a combination of truly understanding who you are and being honest with yourself in your organisation and listening to what other people are doing and seeing what they're saying. Because I think that's for me, was where I began to realise you can have systems but no culture and it doesn't work. You can have culture and systems and it sort of works, but it doesn't take a lot to upset the balance. So you need to have both. But then as I spent more time working on it, that's where I've come to realise that you have to empower your staff, only your leadership can do that. You need the people on the ground, the people with lived experience to contribute what it is that they need. You need to empower them you need to actually work at different levels. That's where I began to realize that none of this is simple. And I don't think that that diagram is the final diagram I'll ever come up with. And I use these presentations a lot to help me push my thinking around. Say, how would I truly explain all of this to somebody else who doesn't know the journey? But I don't know if that answers the question. 
I think it answers the question very well, Karen, actually. Um, there's a load in that of insights into how they can start to approach reflection. And if they don't, if they feel like there's something else they want to dig into, they can they can ask another question. But I think it was it was a good uh, question, a good response for now. Um, but I think, Judy, you wanted to come in on this as well, didn't you? Yes, this is such a good conversation. I'm being very confident in, in uh, thinking I'll, I'll talk about something even more challenging. <laughs> so here I go. The overview of inclusion work is what I myself call the tolerance model. Why is it the tolerance model? Because we're talking about participation, ring fence around strictly career-based settings. Yeah, we, we want people to be comfortable. This is how they uh, come in, talk about the settings and whatnot, but they're all very much career-based and or organizational-based things, even if they're adjusted. Real inclusion is intercultural in a deep sense. And that is very challenging. For example, at Ben, because we had worked with many groups through the years and then through the years, people would become much freer in terms of what they feel allows themselves to be truly present. For example, they will open a meeting with um, black participants. They want to open a meeting by calling in their ancestors. Take a little bowl, sprinkle water, to the four directions. As simple as that, over in 10 seconds, it changes and opens up an entirely different atmosphere, especially for them. They feel the presence of their ancestors. Yeah. So these are the things, or the fact that if you have an Eastern, you call it philosophy or cosmology or whatever you want, and you believe in reincarnation, your whole approach to life is completely different. You know, how you achieve, what you're doing, and, and so on, is shifting. So these things actually have a huge impact on how people see themselves and act as themselves within careers. And of course, some of these things are, are very difficult. For example, I speak with the um, Brazilian, what they call themselves, the, the Brazilian Headwaters Alliance. And they do not recognize country boundaries because they are artificially imposed in colonial times. So they say that within, I think it was Ecuador and Colombia, two or three countries, they have 30 nations, real nations. So they came together. So for example, they, they both tread the very indigenous thing of actually still being hunter-gatherers to people who have been forced and sort of integrated into this, uh, at least bicultural situation in their country. So for example, they would speak Spanish and their own language, and they would go to university in Spanish, and they are very highly educated, PhDs and all sorts of things like that. But what they say is, is that there are things that really jar, that they can never talk about because they know they have to edit them out in order to have an acceptable conversation. For example, believing in spirit. They say, as soon as we talk about the fact that we believe in spirit and the presence of spirit and so on, they say, we are seen as primitive, stupid, superstitious, all those things, and the whole thing just disintegrates. Or people pretend to believe them when they actually cannot, because they just cannot. It's not just a matter for want of trying. They cannot, it's a completely different belief system. And they believe in things like the fact that, for example, that they get deep knowledge like medicinal plants and so on, not because they did trial and error, which science keeps saying, oh, that's because they use it for so many years. Maybe some people died and some people got well and they know about medicine. No, they said from the word go, spirit told us which plants. Now to the West, that is very, very difficult to believe. And yet they, they hang on to this. And the other thing is when they make big decisions, organization decisions about how they speak to the West and so on, and very strictly career and process and, and, uh, and climate change and all that stuff and so on. At the same time, the 30 groups get together and do rituals to consult spirit as part of the equation. 
So when I say say this, I'm just saying that the easy part, which is the best part to start with where everyone feels comfortable, is that career-based setting, is ring fence. And it is a tolerance model because we don't speak about the difficult issues. As long as they are comfortable enough in this setting and feel welcome, we get on with it. Well, thank you for that. No, it's, uh, it's, you're right, it's, it, that's a massive challenge, um, but it's definitely also probably a, an important one. Um, I wonder if, Judy, I could ask an immediate follow-up to that, which is, are you optimistic that we'll get to that level of inclusion one day where we don't have these challenges? Do you yes, think that's I think achievable? that there are many barriers uh, that are there through a uh, rather simplistically understood scientific mind, a kind of mindset which says there are things that can be explained by science and those are the most important. And they forget that actually science is not only explaining, but creating things that are like magic. Yeah? So that at one point you can see that science is always behind reality. And at one point they can find that what they thought was not real and can never be understood actually can. For example, if you ask an indigenous person, show them a computer, and the fact that you type an email, you press a, your, your finger with one tap, and it appears in France instantly, isn't that pure magic? You know, there, there are certain things which we begin to do and to explain that really merges the boundaries. And I think that in time allows for more integrated conversation. I'm very optimistic about that. So not to be simplistic about science. I mean, psychology does the same. For example, the whole thing, indigenous dreaming. What if they perfected processes by which you actually reach into the genius of deep unconsciousness? Look at Einstein. He saw the double helix in a dream. And that's science. No, you're absolutely you're absolutely right. And there is if the core of the scientific method is anything, it is accepting that there are things that we don't yet know and that we should seek to uh, understand and drawing in diverse sources of knowledge is absolutely uh, crucial to the, the scientific process. So I, I think you're absolutely right, Judy. Um, I Not to sort of bring us back down from that very sort of high uh, level and sort of interesting level to the more nuts and bolts. But there's a really interesting question about trustees in the chat uh, directed at you, Karen. So we're going to. Pick, we're going to move back down to trustees of charitable organizations, uh, but I don't want us to lose the sort of energy of that uh, conversation as we do. Um, and it's a simple question, Karen. It's about the role of trustees in driving forward EDI in organizations, uh, which you, you mentioned a little bit about the role of the trustees in BES. But I, I'm aware also others might also have perspectives of this from, from their roles as trustees. So, Karen, let's start with you on that, maybe. Um, they have to give permission. They, they are the people who, who both push and show leadership that EDI matters, but they give permission to, to the staff body to actually pursue those EDI ambitions. They give permission to the members to raise the issues and the challenges and the conversations that they want to have. And I think having a board of trustees who are deeply committed to that is, is really essential. I have spoken to trustees, not ours, but I have spoken to trustees in, in other organisations and, and I find it really quite demotivating when you hear that sentence of, well, why does any of this matter? And we don't have that here. Um, our, our president is, is a British Indian, our first British Indian president, but actually we don't give them a choice. If you're going to be president of the BES, then you kind of assume you're in charge of EDI because that's written into your job description before you ever say yes to that role and that responsibility. And I think as soon as you set that leadership and you say that all of your trustees chair committees and all of them should be showing how they're contributing to your core values, which for us are inclusive, but they're also evidence-led and bold about being brave and making some tough decisions looking at the evidence that's available to you, then I think it gives everybody else permission to have those conversations. And then I think the other really important role is that when you have those really negative voices outside that want to question 
And this is the absolute truth. We have had the occasional member tell us that the focus on EDI takes away from the rigour of the science. Having trustees that will turn around and say, no, that's just not true. Unfortunately, we agree that EDI is central to good science. Then, then you're on to a, a significantly stronger platform from where you can speak. Amazing. Thank you for that, Karen. And uh, and you've also, you'll soon also have a clip of Judy that you can throw into the mix as well to support <laughs> those trustees in making that case. Um, Ethne, uh, you uh, have obviously had uh, some, some non-executive roles as well. So I wonder if you might have any insights on this role of trustees. Yeah, thank you, Joseph. Um, and just to say, I'm sorry, I can't provide anything as meaningful as Judy just talked about there. I think that was such an interesting conversation around um, you know, moving beyond um, the kind of models that we have at the moment in terms of EDI, and it's really interesting. Um, and I agree with what Karen said uh, on this question related to, you know, trustees are the leaders of the organisation. So they need to, you need to have buy-in from EDI at that level. Um, you also need to, I mean, I mean trustees play a, a key and pivotal role in setting the organisational culture. And organisational culture has trickle down effects on, on all of the work of an organisation and how it interacts with its partners, whether it has members, its employees, uh, anyone that it that it um, gets involved with and their wider work. So starting at the top and making sure that organizational culture is aligned with ED&I values is really important. Um, I think the other thing I would add there is um, trustees are also um, in charge of the strategic direction of an organization and making sure that ED&I isn't just a siloed part of what they wanna do. It's not siloed off into a separate EDI function, but it's embedded throughout the strategy um, of an organization um, and through its operations. I think that's really important. And I think trustees can play in that role. And building on what Karen said there about um, you know, some, some trustees maybe not, not feeling like it's aligned with, with this robust science, for example, was, was what you gave, um, is making sure the trustees need to make sure that they understand the role of EDI in meeting their charitable objectives, whatever charity they might. Um, be involved with because EDNI will be relevant to every charity's objectives. So understanding that link and making sure that that's um, well understood across all of the trustees is important. Sorry, I will stop talking in a minute. Uh, I think the other thing that we need to think about when we're talking about boards is making sure that um, they are upskilling themselves in EDNI and making sure they have relevant training so that they can um, make decisions with EDNI embedded. Um, and finally, it's thinking about making sure that it's not just their organization and employees or employees that need to, um, you know, represent diverse voices, but the trustee board needs to as well. So it's thinking about recruitment to trustee boards uh, and how you can make sure that it's truly inclusive throughout the entire organization. Amazing. Thank you. I think you've both given us a lot to think about in response to that um, for, for this person who cares a lot about uh, trustees, the specific driver for this. Um, we are at this point uh, really, really up against it for time. So I think we're going to begin moving towards the outro at this point. Sorry if we didn't get a chance to ask your questions. If you're watching this in the future on, on the YouTube video, you can add your questions in the chat down below and maybe it'll be a chance to get uh, a, more of a conversation going. But Judy, I know, has also put some contact details in the chat if you're particularly interested in talking uh, to Judy. Um, what we'll do maybe then just before we go into the outro is it is quite a complicated topic. There's a lot of moving parts, as we've seen today, is give everybody on the panel just one last chance, one thing that you want people to take away from the conversation, if there was nothing else. And we'll go back down the panel in reverse order. So Karen, we'll, we'll go to you first. If there was a core to your message that you want to get people to take away from this, uh, what would it be? Just an, a sentence or two. Um, it's not simple. It's not easy. But actually, it's the most important thing that we most of us do in our day-to-day -day jobs. Amazing. Thank you. Very simply put and very, I think, uh, simply that it is not simply put, one should say, maybe. Uh, Judy, uh, what's your final takeaway? Well, we live in a world in which multicultural collaboration is our lifeline. And because of that, inclusion is centre stage. Amazing. Thank you. And Ethne, the final word goes to you. Thank you. Um, I would say that systemic issues require systemic intervention. I'll just leave it there. I think we all understand that. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, and thank you uh, again to, to everybody for attending the event. Uh, for those of you who submitted questions as well, and to a, a massive thank you, of course, to all of our speakers, to Ethne, to Judy and to Karen. Uh, what we've discussed today will help to inform our work over the next few months as we produce our vision statement for the future of the environmental sciences. 
Improving ethnic diversity in the sector is also a key focus in the wider work of the IES, with a particular focus on delivering on the recommendations from our report and working on inspiring and enabling those from diverse backgrounds, pursuing and sustaining a career in the environment sector. So keep an eye on our website for more details of those projects uh, as they get started and as they continue. Uh, but our next event as part of the Future of ES23 Horizon Scanning and Foresight work will be on the 4th of August, so the end of this week, it's going to be a discussion on the regulatory landscape. So you can register for that event on our website. For now, though, uh, that's it from us for today. So thank you to everybody for logging in and participating. I hope you found today's webinar beneficial and informative. I certainly did. But And if you are watching the recording on YouTube in the future, uh, please subscribe to our channel, like the video and share it with your friends and colleagues, because this is absolutely a topic where we do need to increase that consciousness, as everybody said. If you've enjoyed today's webinar and you're not a member, please do consider joining the IES to support our work. For now, though, thank you again to all of our speakers and thank you to everybody for attending and for taking part. Hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thank you.